Now, Short appears to be inverting his rook, and that, yes, yet that's had the desired effect. He's confused Kasparov's pieces there. Some of them wondering if gravity's been reversed. One of the pawns has fainted. Oh, Bishop there, vomiting out of pure confusion. So a good move there, I'm sure. A Ken's laser. All right, everybody, welcome to another episode of Occam's Laser. Dilton and Sean here. So today we're going to talk about a couple of different things. We might talk about that black hole picture that everybody's going mad about. Maybe some yes. Israel moon things. And also, uh, we're planning to talk about some AI and chess, which should be interesting. Yes, it will. Sean, what's your favourite chess opening? Queen's Gambit. <laughs> Queen's Gambit? Yes. I wasn't actually expecting a, a legitimate answer, but okay. So one of the, the things I uh, saw last night when I was looking up all this stuff was all of the, the cool names of them all. Like, oh, it's amazing. Yeah, what's the Sicilian something? Yeah, the S- Sicilian defence. I mean, I will pick what moves I make based on the names of the yeah, openings. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have the, so the semi-slav defense, four, ni- four knits, knights four game. Four knights, the four knights game, yeah. Yeah. That's another one. It's nice. There's there's the hyper-accelerated dragon, oh. which is a good one. I, <laughs> Classic. I, I picked that one just because of the name. Like, hyper-accelerated, yeah. amazing. Yeah, and then if, if, if you were asking someone, hey, do you want to do that? And they're like, yes. Then you're like, okay, move the pawn over here. It doesn't, <laughs> yeah. doesn't really do it justice. Yeah. Anyway, we could talk about that later. Yeah. Um, we should probably cover the black hole picture, considering that we tweeted about it. <laughs> yeah, I missed that story entirely. So what is it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm only messing. That's, uh, like, yeah, it's legitimately big news. Yeah, I mean, the media went insane over it. Yeah. Um, I had a question. Uh, Shoot. If you could be part of either the LIGO team that discovered gravitational waves, or this team that took the picture of the black hole, which one would you be on? I mean, hands down, the black hole. Yeah, me too. <laughs> because... <laughs> If you like any love of astronomy is really based on wanting to take a picture of the sky and LIGO ultimately was still just a chirp. signal. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, this is, Hey, the look, it's the there. Cause someone was saying the scientific value of this isn't that amazing uh, yet, but it's like, that's not the point though. Did you see the picture? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's yeah, That's astronomy rather than. Uh, yeah. I think you would, I would pick the black hole team because it's so much more relatable, I think, is the main yeah. main thing. Like people see the picture and they're like, "Oh yes." Whereas when you try to explain gravitational waves, <laughs> like people's minds just melt. Yeah. And like the the LIGO thing was really cool. You know, they had the, all the observations across different like wavelengths and the gravitational wave yeah. detection, and that's amazing. But just the relatability of the picture yeah, of and the it, black hole. It got a conversation thing. going as well. Like yeah. everyone was like, if so many people sent it to me. Like the next day of my friends, like, hey, did you see this? And I was like, yeah, I did. Actually, there yesterday in in the office, we were just like working away, minding our own business. And some guy just came into the office out of the blue and he was like just hyper. He was yapping away, asking about black hole pictures. And like, we don't study black holes. Like, we know a bit about it just because how big it was. But like, um, he was asking like, oh, why the picture looked this way and that way and wasn't like tilted the other way and yeah. why the material was in a ring and all this. <laughs> and we were just like kind of giving him, you know, logic based answers. We were like, well, it could be this, it could be that. And he was like, okay, cool. And like ran out and we we're like, who was that guy? <laughs> he doesn't even, he even go to Trinity or is he? I don't know. He had a name tag on. Yeah. <laughs> name tag didn't have a name on it though. <laughs> uh, or what about um the Higgs boson? Would you, that, that's... Ooh, that was a good discovery. But they well. needed the the press release of god particle to because that's really also hard up. one to explain oh it's the particle that gives everything mass yeah. what the hell does that mean i mean like as somebody who doesn't study high, en- high energy <laughs> physics i like yeah i don't have a great grasp of it you know i understand yeah. the basics and the concept but like i wouldn't be able to explain any of the maths yeah. or anything and they did need to like say the god particle even though that makes no sense really yeah <laughs> yeah but and the the yeah the black hole is the perfect uh, thing for the media you can front page yeah. of a newspaper with no like the sub caption just has to be picture black of black hole <laughs> yeah the end. yeah i mean black holes just capture people's imaginations as well like every single sci-fi movie yeah there's so many of them based around black holes like interstellar like half of star trek episodes you know yeah. like there's so many uh because they're cool yeah but as so as we were 
So we both like data viz stuff and our both of our first things was like the color scheme is not uh, yeah. perceptually uniform. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I saw somebody log that complaint yeah. on their uh, GitHub. But uh yeah, I mean why not? So apparently the one they put in the papers was perceptually uniform yeah. they like edited it, so that's cool. Um, but they they had to make it actually black like imagine they use the color scheme going from like red to blue <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> and it, like every astronomer would would have understood but it would just would have been so confusing in the press on yeah. <laughs> black holes actually but red the, the fact that they had to use even the kind of like yellow hot kind yeah. of black cold even though like everything in the picture was probably like extremely hot yeah like what was the yellow was like 10 to the 9 kelvin and the yeah. black blackish colors were still like 10 to the 7 yeah. kelvin well none of it was optical anyway so i mean we're all yeah. actually just looking at you know sub millimeter signals. Yeah. signals so it's like it's yeah that's the thing have you looked at the algorithm they used for processing the yeah. data yeah very complex <laughs> yeah yeah so we used their code the odd time so low fire so similar to DHD imager in that massive array of telescopes around the world. Interferometry, yeah. yeah. And so the resolution for an interferometer is lambda, so the wavelength of your light over the distance, divided by the distance of your yeah. array. So like low far is so big, but EHD imager is about the same size, but the waves you're looking at with low far are like two meters. Okay. And the EHD imager is like sub millimeter. So you already have a factor of a couple of thousand better resolution you can get yeah. with the EHD just for looking at smaller things. But the like it's still considered radio and like the software they use is like i think for the image was produced using casa which is like bog standard like radio data software yeah. yeah and they use using an algorithm called clean which you know everyone like at a radio interferometer school would have used and it's mm. it, i think it was developed in 1978 yeah and i well that's actually another thing that like the the media narrative always needs you know the the lone wolf the, the person at the front of it because yeah. i saw there was some uh scientist who was like really pushed out as the the person the who did person. the most work yeah <laughs> yeah but i mean it was such a collaborative effort really oh yeah like yeah. massive collaboration loads yeah. of teams multiple countries like crazy yeah. um but does ESG ESG has much longer baselines though right than low fair <laughs> yeah but see it can't be much longer because the radius of the earth is going to be your limiting factor because otherwise yeah. they can't actually look up. But low is just across Europe, right? And they had like a European one, a South American one, and the North American telescopes, right? So it is a good bit bigger. Yeah, yeah. But even if that was a factor of two, like that's not going to get you... Yeah, your, it's a factor of two just on the sky. So. Yeah, your resolution is... is So they got down to like, I think it was micro arc seconds, I think it was micro, which yeah. is... So like low far, it would see an arc second. So that's like a factor of like a million um, mm. better. So they're very small things, but it was something that I've that I I looked up after we were talking about it, like how actually big is it on the sky? And it's about like the black hole is about the width of a human hair at a thousand kilometers. So yeah, the other yeah. analogy I saw was the orange on the moon. Like if you put an orange on the moon, that's how big it was. It was interesting. Yeah. One of so I watched one of the TEDx talks of the postdoc on the team, Katie Bowman. Yeah. Um, she's the person that they keep hyping up or whatever. She obviously did loads of work for it, but um. Yeah. Yeah, she was like put up the highest resolution picture we had of the moon and was like, okay, so one pixel would contain like some amount of million of oranges. And yeah. that's how much lower resolution you have to go to, like to actually. Yeah. Yeah, I know. And I think I saw a bit of that. Like, she's such a good role model. It'll definitely inspire so many people. Oh, de- like, she was so enthusiastic to to, about yeah. like what she was doing. Yeah, she's and a she great came person. from like a computer science. Yeah. side of things instead of the physics side of things yeah which might explain it <laughs> it's, al- it's always tricky though like showing an optical picture and then say like because the oh, the yeah. your the regime is so different yeah. that you're dominated by different effects <clears throat> so for um like for low fire the biggest problem is the the ionosphere is just a pain yeah. in the ass and it distorts your signal completely but then in the regime there at it's actually not nearly as bad yeah um but if you go up to like x-rays you know so the atmosphere blocks the whole thing so yeah you have to go to space yeah there, there's such different um problems for every yeah i was actually uh saw that because everybody's like oh yeah that was cool like amazing work and really cool picture but it was m87 like when are we getting a picture of uh, our black hole. our black hole, our personal black hole that we can relate to? <laughs> yeah. Um, and they're saying you know it's kind of harder because it's a much smaller size uh, of a black hole, uh, but it is a lot closer. But then they were saying, oh well, just put well, obviously this is hypothetical. We'll put like satellites in space to be part of the uh, interferometer. Mm. That is so difficult to do though. People have been talking about that 
not related to the black hole thing at all like completely different collaborative teams trying to do different things with radio astronomy it's so hard to do that so at the minute they're trying to do that with the lisa mission in isa where they do it um for gravitational waves and they use like laser optics to try and place because you need to know where your satellites are you're talking about having an array of satellites in space where yeah, they're thousands of thousands of kilometers apart, and you have to know their position within. Yeah, so a like the, of the radius of the Earth yeah. is like six thousand kilometers, roughly. Yeah. So you're talking, yeah, tens of thousands of kilometers yeah. apart, and you have to know down to the yeah. For radio, it's probably not as accurate, or you probably don't need it as accurate as say like, um, lasers. Uh, yeah. But you, it's probably it's pretty gonna close. Be yeah, you want it millimeters least, or yeah. less. Um, yeah. And across that distance, it's so hard, and then you have to synchronize all of their clocks. And you have to also take into effect into into account like they'll be orbiting, so you have to time everything perfectly. They all have to mm. because if some of them are behind the Earth, then they couldn't observe in the right direction. It gets so complicated. But space VLBI has already partially been done. So there's mm. like um, Radio Astron is a is a Russian project where they have one satellite in space, and then that makes a baseline with other satellites on Earth. On Earth, just one. Yeah, yeah. but the problem is then that actually doesn't give you very good UV coverage. So just yeah, so yeah. like none of these things are even observing optical light. So yeah. you're actually making measurements in the foyer plane, which is also another uh, thing that's hard to explain when you're just talking to people. Yeah, about. I saw, um, I'm trying to remember the analogy they used for the Fourier plane. Oh yeah, she used a, a disco ball mm-hmm. and saying like if you had a disco ball, it was like loads of different mirrors uh, and then you like took all of the mirrors off and only left a couple then like imagine trying to reconstruct the image reflected off that uh, disco ball from just those couple of mirrors yeah that's actually that true for the, that's a like um a really big issue with the eht and the black hole image was that their coverage was really bad and they, that's why they needed such a like good complex algorithm to reconstruct the image but one of the things you want for an interferometer is like yeah you should have your telescopes going north to south because as the earth rotates then you can yeah, kind the of earth get... will cover that by just rotating but so it was, it was kind of a fundamental misunderstanding that people were having when they're like, oh, they're just going to put ones in space and that's going to be it. But you still need good coverage. Like it's still really yeah. hard to do unless you have good coverage. And there's no point in, say, like someone who's, somebody uh, I saw online on Reddit was like, oh, just put them on like uh, Mars or something. But then that baseline is only sensitive to the tiniest of scales and will only pick up a couple of photons and it's basically useless. Yeah, you can't calibrate it. Yeah. And also like the E, well, go on. Yeah, well, it's just like, because that baseline is only sensitive to one specific uh, wavelength, mm. then, or, well, um, distance, resolution on the sky, you're only, and it's going to be a tiny scale, you're only going to get a couple of photons, so it doesn't even matter if it's calibrated or not, because you're just going to have a few photons from it, and then you spent billions putting a, yeah, like a station on Mars. Yeah, you'd have to wait it with the UV. Or, but the, the other thing is, like, in terms of funding... They didn't even get money to build EHT. Like, so that was yeah. just used pre-existing yeah. stuff. So the fact that they think, you know, somehow science would get enough money to send a ra- into space. <laughs> something to Mars. Them. And then like, and then also to put something on Mars you without human intervention, to just get something to land and know where it is on Mars, yeah. you know, it, it's not going to happen. Yeah. So, um, I remember there was an idea to do it on the moon, on mm. the far side of the moon, so that it would cut out a load of radio interference. And they were kind of one of the main reasons. There was multiple, you know, scientific goals from it, and it didn't actually come about. Maybe they will do it sometime in the future, but the idea was to look at radio emission from exoplanets, and um, because you go down to low enough frequencies that the ionosphere just becomes an issue the atmosphere gets in the way again and they're like oh if we put one on the moon with no atmosphere we can go straight down like to really low frequencies and it should be easier to detect exoplanets at radio wavelengths down at those frequencies and and their idea was to just like send up some rockets that would land and automatically roll out a carpet of antenna that would just be their detectors but like there's so many things that could go wrong it's so hard to like account for any of that so i think it was scrapped in the end but but, but even low far like needs constant maintenance i mean things just i guess on the moon the conditions are, would be way more stable but things it's still very difficult to do but um it's worth hammering home the point about so the black hole the center of our galaxy sagittarius a star is way closer i mean it's what it, 
it's like something 50,000 light years, I think. Yeah. And M87 is billions of light years away. Uh, 55 million. 55 million. Yeah. But it's it's like a thousand times or a million times bigger than the one in our galaxy. Yeah. So it's it's effectively the same size in the sky. But one of the problems with the one in our galaxy is you're observing through the interstellar medium and then... Yeah, you're observing through the galaxy itself. Because yeah. we're in the, the plane. We're in yeah, the disk. Of there's the crap in the way. <laughs> so it's just easier to look at, at other things. Yeah, it's hard to like... I imagine there could be... Uh, kind of a saturation of radio sources around the center of the yeah. galaxy of, of our of our galaxy because it's you're looking through everything so it's hard to tell if it's like in in front of uh, Sagittarius A or like behind so it's kind of difficult to do. But the, actually, the last thing I would say on it is for, like when this, so I watched the press conference when it came out and it was deadly and it was cool that it was synchronized across all different countries and stuff mm-hmm. and then. Um, for like a day in the news it was great and then it just got on twitter got really toxic and then i just well, that's avoid. Twitter. yeah but it, so <laughs> so first of all people were pissed off that your one uh katie was getting weight loads of credit and do you see someone made a horrible post about how no um they like this long like ms paint style uh graphic about okay. the lines of code she contributed to github versus how much men contributed oh, and, uh, it's and then, right, then the whole gender race. yeah it's just so like just let her it's like, unfortunate yeah, because she, i saw yeah. something similar and i think it was probably a backlash in response to the press she was getting and yeah. it was like one of the guys on the team who had nothing to do with the post online and it was like oh this guy contributed like eight hundred fifty thousand lines of code uh, out of the 900,000 lines of code on the GitHub. But, I mean, like, this is not taking away from anything he's done, but something like, you know, 500,000 lines were a uh, commit from, Important. like, data yeah. lines. Yeah. It was just data, like, that was just important. Also, lines of code have no significance yeah. whatsoever. It's well, such a yeah. rant. Like, people who don't code don't yeah. know that, but, like, it doesn't yeah. have any meaning because you could just skip a load of lines. You can, like, take 10 lines to do what somebody would do in one line. Yeah, and that's better, arguably, coding. Yeah. But I agree. She's, like, definitely well-earned her moment in the spotlight. Yeah, like, her um, CV is unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. And then on the flip side of it, like, she wasn't, like, even the lead of the EHT project. Yeah. She, I think she just had, like, quite good uh, PR skills in terms of, like, she had that TEDx talk and stuff, so people mm. would stumble across all of that. Yeah. And she was very good at getting the points across. So yeah. So she's no, obviously she, just yeah. going to be... The media yeah. are going to love that. Because but... It, but I mean, it, like it as a so she, you know her background is computer science and stuff. Like mm-hmm. all of us in, so we're trying to make a long baseline pipeline for LoFar. So to do a similar thing with radio, but we'll never get down to that resolution to see anything. Yeah. But it's so hard. Like we've like a team of people, probably like ten or twenty people across Europe, trying to do it for like five or six years. Like from like from professors to postdocs and people who have like tons of experience in radio astronomy but we would just all love a computer scientist to be involved yeah because the like we don't know how to make things run faster or yeah. organize data and yeah, stuff yeah like so. some people might have a vague idea but it's not like they've worked in computer science yeah where, exactly and where those people that do work in computer science it's literally their job like it doesn't matter what the algorithm does even yeah. they just have to make it work better yeah, uh, and for them, it's probably also like obvious to not do something one way or another. So yeah, I, I can read really, you yeah. could be easily making lots of mistakes as a physicist. Yeah, uh, trying to code things up like we, it's kind of a functional way of doing it. It's like oh, well, we know what we want to get out of our code, so we'll just make it work. Yeah, but it could be the most inefficient way to do it. And we were actually talking about that recently in the office. It was like across any sort of code, from just like your personal data analysis of your PhD data up to something as massive and collaborative as that like it would just be so beneficial if every not even if there was a computer science scientist working with every group but if the computer science and physics departments just worked collaboratively more often yeah because then like never but like the way you could you have a like a a support system in a physics department of like it and admin if you also had a computer science you're like hey we've got this thing we just need a bit of uh help yeah (laughs) So I can really see how she was the linchpin in the analysis because I'm sure without like a computer yeah. science eye. I'm sure there was um, multiple other people that also had yeah. computer science backgrounds. It seemed like there was uh, quite a few, but um, yeah, fair play to them. It was a cool picture. It was very nice, very yeah. pretty. And it was one of the few, like very often I don't pay attention to those things and don't get excited by them. Like, you mm. know, oh, there's a super blood moon yesterday. And yeah, yeah. I don't even know what happened. But yeah. this was one thing I was actually like, oh, that's Following. deadly. 
it was something I wasn't following at all. And then when it, like a week before you yeah. actually mentioned it and then I was like, oh, that's cool. And um, the, the last thing I'll say in it, so this is, it's kind of in line with what we do. So we look at AGN, so we look at active galaxies and we don't get anywhere near the black holes, but we can see the jets coming out of them. Hmm. Um, and every paper that, that I read about active galaxies, you always have to say, uh, we believe that there's a supermassive black hole at, at the, the center, center yeah. creating material. And you and like you can never say there is because mm. we've never seen one and it's just yeah. it fits well with the theory. So I'm just glad now that I can say yeah, some words. You can cite their paper. I can't wait there to yeah. Because <laughs> the day after I checked on the archive just to see if anyone like, you know, were gonna submit something and then just threw in a reference to their yeah. uh, to their letters. Did that, did anybody No, not not the day <laughs> after, but they might but probably by, by now yeah. somebody just like add this reference in yeah. please. It would help your own read reads I'd say. Oh definitely, yeah, because yeah, people will be looking at those like citations. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So in other news, did you see that uh, Israel tried to? No, not the government. It was a private. <laughs> it was a private venture. But an Israel. Let me get the name actually of the company. Yeah. So the Israel Aerospace Industries tried to land uh, on the moon with a, a robot, uh, some sort of rover. So I just saw a headline that it crash landed. Yes. But was it like that an unintentional or? It was yeah, it wasn't meant to happen. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so it was just an interesting little thing that happened in the news like yesterday or the day before. But it's interesting because it would have been the first private uh, venture to actually land on the moon. And even in terms of like nations, the, there's only three that have done it. It's China, Russia, and the US. So for a private company to go and do it was like ambitious enough anyway and they got pretty close i mean they were very obviously you can just like fire something at the moon and if it crashes you're like oh well, we got close yeah but um it seems like they were not expecting it to go wrong until the very last second they're like oh crap something but i wonder if they rushed through like if they feel pressure in the private space industry and they kind of rushed through stuff that they would have liked to have spent a bit more time testing or uh yeah I mean, possibly, because they probably have people invested in it or something. So yeah, maybe but it's just that I've never heard of them. And neither did I yeah. until the news came out yesterday. It was actually, mm -hmm. there was um, a Twitter feed for someone in uh, the Netherlands um, that I, f I saw they were tweeting about it, and they're working with some big radio uh, dish in the Netherlands, and they were able to just, like, point at the moon and pick up the signal from the Israelite, like, satellite, and... Uh, they could like see and they were kind of live tweeting like oh here it is now getting close to the moon yeah, and then they were yeah. like oh the signal went oh no <laughs> that's not good <laughs> which was kind of funny because they had nothing to do with yeah, the mission they, they were just are... observing the signals yeah. coming from the satellite it's itself. like they're coming mission control by accident yeah yeah pretty much just live tweeting like uh and and the company are like please don't uh, live tweet our information <laughs> <laughs> um that's good what else yeah. did it do um, well, I actually don't know what it was supposed to do, but I just saw that it smacked into the moon, which was pretty it funny. It kind of got overshadowed by, like, any science release has kind of been overshadowed by the oh, black yeah, hole the stuff. Oh, yeah, black hole thing was the place to be, but Because even, was actually, cool. LIGO had a detection last week, didn't they? And it, on Monday, and they were like, hey, gravitational wave. And we were like, yeah, we don't care anymore. <laughs> it was like, yeah, we're over gravitational waves. That yeah. was two years ago. Yeah. Was, so 2016 or And the, like, 12th one isn't as exciting as the... Yeah, that's the thing. They have detected multiple ones even since. It's not like it's the second or third one they've done. Like yeah. it's they're in the tens now at the stage. So yeah, um, but yeah, cool. The the other thing that I might we can chop mm -hmm. this out, but uh, <laughs> the <laughs> we'll have to chop out you saying you can chop it. Out. <laughs> the, the thing that struck me was, um, imagine being a referee on the black hole paper. Yeah, you know if they're just like. And then you critiquing it, being like, hmm, looks kind of small or something. Like, <laughs> Not quite black enough. It'd be so hard to uh, to give feedback on that. Yeah, I mean, because it's such uh, a pioneering thing, like nobody has ever taken a picture of a black hole, so it's kind of hard to... Also, it'd be a lot of pressure because I don't know if you would know as a referee on that paper, but they had like six papers. Mm. You would Maybe you would be referee on all six. Like there would be six referees probably like sharing it collaboratively maybe. I don't yeah. know. But they would want to release all those papers on the, the announcement dates and like you want yeah. to be holding that up. And... I'm sure they just got a week to do it or something. They were just told like, you know, this you is need the to biggest. Get this. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Um, it wouldn't be fun. I would not like to be <clears throat> doing that. <laughs> the, the, yeah, especially if you really were holding it up. Yeah. Uh, 
and the only other thing that that people have been asking me about so you know you're saying that guy ran into your office and yeah. he was <laughs> saying about what's up with the black holes but <laughs> it it's weird that like black hole makes it sound like a 2d hole but it's a 3d hole yeah so they can have a shadow but like the idea that a hole which is just you know an absence of material can have a shadow is kind of weird yeah i mean this is the thing is that people don't understand that it's not even a solid body yeah it's, it's actually a singularity it's a region of space rather than a physical yeah. there. and like they they always confuse the event horizon with the actual body itself but like if you were mm. if something was passing through that it wouldn't just like hit it and suddenly yeah. stop it would just pass through and keep going yeah that that's the 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 smarmy uh come back well they didn't actually take a picture of the black hole <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah i mean you could probably keep saying that I don't think. yeah it's like because the black hole doesn't actually emit like, yeah, but you could go into it and uh, die. <laughs> <laughs> well, interstellar. Uh, this is the thing, actually, is because it's such a massive black hole, the gravitational, uh, like the gradient of gravity at the edge of it mightn't be strong enough to like kill you straight away. Yeah. this is. I think that also is a plot in inter- or part of interstellar, like, oh, it'll be fine. But um, yeah, so where the smaller black holes, because you get closer, you're closer to the center, the gradient is much steeper and then you'll just be like, Spaghettified, spaghettified, yeah, as, and that's like just the difference of between the gravity at your feet versus your head is just stretching out. Yeah, pretty much. Um, but at the with the supermassive black holes, like it's larger than our solar system or something. Yeah, which is absolutely huge. Like, but it's um, it's emitting a jet. Like the jets from M eighty seven are like hundreds of thousands of light years going out in space. Yeah, like isn't, that's insane. And if if that like it would be so cool if our galaxy had jets. If it was an active galaxy, like I wonder how big it would be on the sky. You know, maybe because you can see the milky way and it would be a comparable size to the milky way yeah but just like perpendicularly just a straight jet yeah that would be pretty cool although maybe being in a galaxy with jets somehow prevents life yeah they don't emit in the optical either so are very Uh, uh, not as much uh, observe it more radio this is turning into like a radio podcast and not not (laughs) not a radio podcast oh you've been working up to that one for a while (laughs) all right Let's get out of radio then. Let's talk about games. Gaming. First ever computer game. This is our the start of our gaming podcast that we're starting. (laughs) Go on though. This this is what led me down to what was the first ever computer game in history? First ever computer game? And what you're defining as computer game. I love I love adding numbers. (laughs) One plus one. I don't know, probably like actual with like a controller where you played a game that was considered fun. No. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, like I would, in my head, I would imagine like Pong. So there was an uh, automaton that played chess in like 1915. 1915? <clears throat> yeah. So, I mean, it was just like a robot and it could play an end game with three moves or with three pieces left. Okay. So it couldn't actually play a full game of chess. Uh, no, but it and played. When you say oh, like it was a, was it a physical robot that actually moved things? Yeah. So this is actually something I came across while looking at chess AI in general. Mm. Was that like 30, 40 years ago they still had like oh this robot look at it playing chess and then they realized you know what we don't need the robot. Yeah, that's the mechanical. <laughs> like, yeah, bit. people don't really care about the robot moving the pieces, especially because now like so many people play chess online anyway. You just play against the. Like you could be playing against a computer, and technically you wouldn't know. Yeah. If somebody, if like, if that was screened. Yeah. Um. So they just like dropped that when it was coming into like the eighties and nineties. You're like. It looks you know what, dated though. Like yeah. Versus this cause... big old massive mechanical arm that just moves a piece around. Yeah. that could like knock over stuff. But, but that was as impressive at the time, you know. So it's just that. Yeah. But because I watched a bit of, and we'll get onto this later, but the AlphaGo thing, and like that was, yeah, you just see like this intermediate guy who sits there and plays the computer's moves for him. Yeah. And I would just feel, feel like he just looks like such a little sucker, you know, because <laughs> the computer's like, do this. And he's like, okay, you know, and he doesn't know what to do next. And he has to wait for the computer to tell him what to yeah, do. Like, he, like, it's funny though, because like he mightn't ever have played Go in his life. Yeah, but I'm sure he's, he's one of the developers or something. Oh yeah, probably. He's probably like a software engineer. But, um, but the so the, there's actually a long history of fake of of chess um fake chess ro- ro- robots <laughs> that that didn't really do it like one of them was the most famous one is the mechanical turk which was this like uh mm-hmm. thing that was brought around and to different countries um but it was actually just a man in in yeah. playing that's actually like quite a popular 
yeah it pop is. culture reference in terms of like something being fake and not what it appears to be and stuff. yeah yeah because yeah. amazon have a website now called uh amazon's mechanical turk i think for mm-hmm. it uh, it it's you can log in and earn like five cent for clicking a load of things or whatever but it, it's a way of doing things humans can do that uh, computers can't do and with yeah. reference back to that and you're saying that co- comes from um some guy that was playing chess so yeah it was a mechanical robot or thing it looked that like a mechanical supposed robot to be, yeah but it actually inside. had a series of pulleys in its ah, okay. robotic arms and underneath the board was a chess player who would just <laughs> who couldn't play. see the board <laughs> yeah there was a yeah <laughs> so you need two people <laughs> yeah yeah so it was but it was yeah it was good to see that that's where it actually comes from that's interesting yeah so did you look at the science paper that uh alpha go published in like 2018 no i didn't yeah, I just glanced at it and it was kind of very, very in-depth. So what I did was um, I spent about half an hour learning how to play Go. Because oh, I was like... Oh, what a waste of time. Well, I was like, I don't know what it is. <laughs> and then I just was watching a bit of it on... like, So there's a four-hour YouTube video of the AlphaGo how game. to play Go. <laughs> <laughs> but of the AlphaGo and Google uh, and, and game. And like people were getting excited and they're like... And they put down this little white stone here and I was like... Mm. I actually don't know what's going yeah, on. Yeah, you don't know the significance of anything yeah. happening. But Go is a fairly complicated game to... Like, it's simple mm. enough rules, but to be able to actually master it's almost impossible. Yeah, because the tactics are beyond crazy. Me, I, would, yeah. I know when that happened, though, I remember people were, like, commentators, experts were like, oh my God, what's it doing? Because usually people start at a side or a corner, or near enough to a side or a corner, and that you play there kind of and spread out and that was kind of the accepted tactic by the like grandmasters or whatever of go um but yeah alpha go then started putting like um i don't know what you call them little pebbles little, little white, yeah. white pebbles stones St- stones maybe yeah uh just put them out in the middle and the person who's playing was like ah! what is happening <laughs> i don't actually know how to play against this but um yeah so the one of the good things about the go thing i guess we'll go back to chess after but that was a like go actually has more permutations than chess i mean i think it's less strategic in that it's more forgiving if you make a bad move yeah um but But yeah it's way more possible moves yeah so you have to you can't i mean there's no way you can brute force it um so it's worth saying that that even the game like chess the reason this was always a popular problem is because the the amount of possible moves are permutations in chess are like 10 to the power of 120 mm. and i think the amount of atoms in the universe is like 10 to the power of 80 so there's Something like that, yeah. trillions upon trillions upon trillions more ways you could play chess and yeah. something like within if two people play within like five moves each it, you're probably in a configuration of the board that's never been played or, mm-hmm. or some kind of sequence yeah. so classically computers have just run through every possible yeah. move and said which one is the best but chess you can't do that so the only way to get around it is to have the machine somehow kind of learn how to play as it goes and it was always held up as a um oh this is a mark of true in- intelligence and if a computer can play chess then a computer is intelligent smart yeah except it's so narrow like you're just teaching it to do this one thing but but go yeah i mean go has so many more possibilities it's such a bigger board compared to chess right so it's mm. like 19 by 19 compared to 8 by 8 yeah. So even that alone just makes the permutations of Go just crazy. Yeah. Um. But yeah, so the brute force thing, I guess, brute forcing chess is kind of, and it's what some of the top engines do now. So mm. Alpha Zero is uh, the DeepMind engine that did the like machine learning, which is a completely different method. But the top kind of classical engines, I guess you could call them, just brute force. They they have an opening book. Yeah. And then they'll use that to just play openings that they think are beneficial against other like defenses or defenses against opponents' openings. And then from there, they'll just brute force moves and see which gives them an advantage, to, like 20 moves down the yeah. line. And they'll calculate every possible 20 moves that the opponent could play. Um, yeah, so I think they can calculate millions of possible moves a second. So like, yeah. they're still searching a lot, but they they do an alpha beta search where they can they can kind of trim off entirely uh, branches branches of, of, of the, the possibilities game, yeah. uh, so it doesn't actually have to be as thorough but you're right that the 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 first time a computer beat person was when um 
or like a good person, obviously. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you get any people. computer to beat one of us, yeah. probably. <laughs> but it was uh, Gary Kasparov in 1997 with um, mm. Deep My Deep Blue. I think yeah, it was not, not Deep Mind. Deep Mind yeah. is the company yeah. that does Alpha Zero. But yeah. Uh, Deep Blue was the name. It was an IBM thing. Yeah. Um, Which was a like a supercomputer, right? Yeah. yeah. But n- but now you can get uh, you can install the chess engine on your laptop yeah. that could destroy Deep Deep Blue. Yeah. Um, which is just funny that that the like now there's no way a human could even come close to beating chess that you can get on your mobile phone like. Yeah, no, it's impossible. I've yeah. tried. Yeah. <laughs> just lose within like 10 moves. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so they actually, I know chess.com had a computer, a computer uh, chess championship mm. where they'd like pit some of the uh, top engines against each other. So the top engine that has been around for quite a while now is Stockfish. And yeah. they release kind of new versions of Stockfish every couple of years. And it's open source. As well. It is open source. So yeah. a lot of the top maybe 10 engines, uh, I'd say half of them are open source and the other half aren't. There's like Some of them were open source and then they make them not open source. <laughs> but it's kind of weird. Like I don't know why anybody would kind of hide it at this stage. Like You've got the best one in the world. Well, Stockfish mm. is, is kind of taken to be the best. And it's open source. So I mean, why keep the other ones private i don't really understand that but yeah because you think it would in a way it would boost the amount of people who are contributing to it but then i guess yeah. you're opening up to opponents i guess it if it's, if people have money in it uh, then it's their decision to yeah that's true um one issue with with those so one issue with the uh these engines in general is when you're playing them against each other is that the amount of resources they have um so if you give one engine more resources over the other, so like more RAM or better processors, mm. it'll probably beat the other one, even if the other one is technically better. So I think in those chess championships, they did they tried to keep it as level a field as possible. But when you get to the machine learning engines like AlphaZero, that becomes much harder because it's hard to quantify the processes they do against each other. Yeah. So for example, if you give Stockfish uh, a load of RAM to do a lot of brute forcing and really like say 16 processors or like the newest processors that they have um how do you quantify that against alpha zeros like uh specifically designed tensor boards that they have to make to do the calculations for a neural network it's kind of hard to quantify you know yeah it is hard to quantify yes i don't it's a it's a an issue that people have had because alpha zero bet stockfish a couple of years ago mm. and that was big news because it, Alpha Zero doesn't use any of the brute forcing. It trains itself how to, like, it basically learns how to play chess by playing chess. I don't think they even include the rules necessarily, uh, or the. I don't think they have to. I don't yeah. know if they did for that specific game or how they trained it exactly. Mm. But yeah, I don't think they have to include the rules. They just mm. say, they just give it a set of like, do this, and then you'll get a reward. Yeah. If you make a move, if you move a pawn here, if you move a queen here, um, or if you capture an opponent's piece. And then, like, capturing or checkmating the opponent's king would be the maximum reward. For yeah. Them. But in a way, it doesn't even know it's play. you know, it's... Right, it doesn't know it's playing yeah. chess. It's just yeah. following like, some rules, yeah. some base rules that they gave it. But not, not, not that many rules, which is surprising. Mm. And also, obviously, it trains on millions of games, but yeah. um, they also train on games against themselves. And then they can yeah. just play and iteratively improve by, by playing themselves. But I think yeah. if they're trained on... Often it's like say ten million chess matches that they all this data is online, so it's easy to get now. But like, if a human was to get enough experience having played, you know, a million chess matches, I mean, mm-hmm. you're talking hundreds of games a day for decades, like before you would reach that level, and that's assuming you remembered perfectly every situation you were ever in. Yeah, so which you definitely would. Yeah, so as soon as these are switched on, they just blitz past any. Yeah, so like Magnus Carlsen is the number one chess player at the minute and he has been for a few years now um and it is said but I, this is the thing it could be complete he's a fabrication robot. but it said like he can remember like ten thousand opening games like for the first 10 moves which is an incredible mm. advantage to have against anybody even other grandmasters like that's so many games to remember and like i mean that just comes down to memory rather than yeah. anything else is I, there a better use of it <laughs> of, of that memory yeah, <laughs> yeah probably um but he wins money and stuff and gets sponsorships, so it's a yeah. job. Like, yeah, yeah. 
but I know like the famous Bobby Fischer would like mm. hated people memorizing openings because it can give you such an advantage if you just don't know anything about chess or logic or you know mm. moving pieces around and how that would give you an advantage like five moves down the, the end of the line. You could learn ten moves into an opening and learn as many openings as you possibly could, and that could give you a huge advantage against somebody who's just more intuitively. But that's what these basic algorithms did, where they have massive opening books that you were saying yeah. earlier. They just have all of this mapped out, so they just pick one and and yeah. They have another variant of chess where you start with, um, instead of like the correct positions for the back rank of all of your like higher value pieces, um, like your. So they leave the pawns where they are, but then they swap around the positions of randomly of the like rooks and knights and bishops and king and queen. So you can't learn an opening for yeah. it. And you start randomly and then you have to play the game based on where all the pieces are, which is much more intuitive. It's actually really hard to do. I saw a chess 960 and I was coming yeah. up with Fisher, but some of the quotes about it, like some people are like, oh, this is good because it removes, like uh, it's really? all down to skill then. Um, but then some people were saying like chess is hard enough as it is without... <laughs> I think people who are good at chess 960 have a huge advantage in normal chess though because it just mm. it's just the process of logically thinking out moves. Yeah. So I think that does. But I was surprised by how many variations of chess do a chess do exist because there's also like an infinite board or like there's so many different <laughs> or or people play with just like less pieces or just play an end game or there's a 5 by 5 board I think as well people play on with different pieces. I haven't seen that. There's a four four player chess as well. Oh, which is like 3D crazy. chess. <laughs> There's 3D chess, which I've never played. I don't even know no. if it's good. But the four player chess is crazy. I've played that a few times on online and it's so hard to like it's hard to, it is hard enough playing against one opponent. Yeah. But playing against three opponents when so you don't know who they are, they're not there in front of you and you don't know what they're even considering. Like if they're there in front of you, you could kind of maybe like like in poker, you could kind of like judge maybe that they're going to attack you yeah. instead of somebody else. Yeah. But over the computer, it's impossible to know. So you could just be trying to focus on one person or maybe like spread it across all three and then you get absolutely annihilated by all three people because yeah. they all decide to attack you at the same time. But one of the, so one of the reasons that a lot of these variations have come about is because people want to remove any way, like something bring back to just human based things mm-hmm. where there's no advantage of computers because there's even controversy in the, in the world championships in 2007 of someone kept going to the bathroom um yeah. and yeah and then like an analysis afterwards showed that like 87 percent of his moves matched a chess some really popular chess An engine, engine. And, yeah. um but that didn't end well for people but there was a game then invented in 2003 called arima that was a two-player kind of strategy game okay. and it was designed to be playable by a standard chess set um but difficult for computers to play okay so this was in 2003 uh, and it's easy to learn fun and whatever. But in 2015, computers Destroyed. blitz past people. Yeah. So That's it's hilarious. just like, you know, you just, but every time there's a game, people say, okay, this is, no, like that was actually easy. This is the new standard of whether you can, a computer is smart. Yeah. And then they always just catch up. And because mm-hmm. like the problem of chess, it looked, so it was, uh, what, what's his first name? Shannon, Claude, Claude. The like inter- information theorist guy in the fifties. He was I'm not sure, but he he was kind of saying like, yeah, chess is the ultimate aim of of our pinnacle of intelligence. But then mm. yeah, once you get into it, then and you've got enough computers, then it kind of falls apart. And then people yeah. say, oh, blackjack maybe if a computer can play blackjack because there, <laughs> there's you know even more ways that can go. But you know computers are better than. Most. But that's the thing. I mean, you can keep making problems, but because people haven't kind of designed the computers specifically for those problems. They won't be that good at them at first, but then yeah. people will figure out ways to make those algorithms better, mm. and then they'll just they'll beat them eventually. Like, uh, yeah, I think when... it goes for everything. Like because AlphaGo eventually, better, you know, wasn't able to compete with anybody at Go, or like not many, and then eventually it bet like the best Go player in the world. Like so. Yeah, but but people assume oh if it's able to be that good at Go, then in theory it must be able to do other stuff but we've actually found we can actually make things that are niche enough that you know it could apply but it's not like it's automatically good at other things you still have to yeah i guess that was the uh, benefit of alpha zero is that it can train at all of those games given just some base rules you just have to train the algorithm yeah whereas with the other like there's no way stockfish could play go yeah yeah or even chess without one piece uh, yeah, know, like, yeah, it would just like immediately think it's at a disadvantage and just play for a draw or something. Yeah. Um. 
but yeah i think like that's amazing in itself that you can now there's an algorithm there and like they probably did tweak it but it, overall it can play multiple different games given just the base rules yeah but you do have to it plays itself or somebody like millions of or thousands of millions of times before yeah so these that. like to the reason these are different these deep learning al- algorithms they're they're based on neural networks where they're just I mean, it's it's a close enough approximation to learning, I suppose. All it is is developing a set of weights yeah. for a, a, a set of solutions, and then it it just finds the best strategy. So in theory, the yeah, much, yeah, in theory it should. And it, but the analogy to your brain is if you do, you know, some rock climbing or something, that'll uh, build up the neural pathways in your brain for yeah. that. And 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 so there's an analogy there to how people learn. Um, so it's good that at least they figured out how computers do that. But there was two chess engines I looked up that that do this. Deep Chess was one, and Giraffe was another. Okay. Um, but they both used deep learning. But an earlier version of uh, Deep Chess actually used uh, the genetic algorithm, which is something that I've mm-hmm. played around with before, and that's cool because it's it's basically taking the principle of um, evolution yeah. of yeah. coding it in. And then it has all the different possibilities, almost survival of the fittest between them all. And then that one has offspring. And then it yeah, introduces... Yeah, so what you do is you make, say, a hundred of them, mm. like a hundred of that engine playing and get them all to play each other or something. In this scenario, you probably make them play each other. And then you take the top half of so the, all of the ones who won. Or there could be a lot of draws, so you might make it smaller than that. You might just take the top 10%. And then you have a mutation factor. Yeah. Which is interesting. So you just change some of the weights, like what it's likely to play and what it's not likely to play. But just, just flipping bits, randomly. Yeah. yeah, you're just randomly doing it. And you're always taking the top 10%. And then you just run through generations. And they have babies, yeah. Yeah, it's actually, it's a very, very interesting way of doing it. Some, you know, it's not efficient for every problem, but it's cool for the ones that it, it works for. It's but it's it's funny that between that and also neural networks, like both of them kind of have an origin in biology to some extent of... Uh, yeah, it's just like trying to copy because yeah, we do those things <laughs> yeah i mean not exactly but yeah, yeah it's kind of like an approximation especially like neural networks are kind of it's not exactly the way neurons work um and people kind of i know there's like some uh, machine learning engineers don't like the analogy of like neurons mm-hmm. because like with uh, a neural network like you can retrain your network based on different yeah. input data and then the weights change and stuff so there's lots of like different reasons for that but yeah that's a fair so. point and also like 50 years ago they probably would have compared it to you know a railroad like there, there was different analogies at the time like yeah. the time now is always kind of computer brain yeah people just love making brains the idea of artificial intelligence in general yeah. because the like 50 years ago the analogy for how the body worked was always like a pump and a, a, like a steam a, like a rail Piston, like yeah. yeah and then that kind of changed as well as as like people don't they really like, get oh, the oh muscles are made of muscle fibers and those yeah. muscle fibers depend on biochemistry you know? yeah um so the other thing to say is chess isn't solved or nearly solved so t- no. to say a game is solved means that every move can be if given if you're white or because so white goes first they always have the advantage or slight advantage yeah. but that means you you know the moves to make that you would never lose in yes. theory yeah you could always draw but that doesn't work for guess but it so it works for like uh i think they've done it for drafts and i think mm-hmm. they've done it for like obviously you can do it easily for tic-tac-toe when, like when you're yeah, in school you figure out how to never how to never, never lose, lose it but they did it for drafts right but but it always assumes, uh, so in game theory, it always assumes that your opponent is playing optimally. Yes. Um, but if your opponent doesn't play optimally, it actually doesn't always, it can, It still doesn't always uh, win. Okay. But this just reminded me of the fact that, like, if you're playing someone really terrible at something, okay. very often it, you know, like you were saying when AlphaGo put the yeah. pieces in the middle of the board, it can throw you so much that you don't know oh, what Oh yeah, doing. like if you're playing a beginner, like say if you've played chess for 10 years and then you play a beginner. Yeah. I get, that could be where like beginner's luck comes from because yeah. you're like, oh, that move is so unorthodox and then you make a mistake based off that un- unorthodox move and yeah. you're like, oh. You're like, oh, they must be now? thinking of a strategy and yeah, they're not. Yeah, you're trying just, to rack your brain yeah. being like, oh, that what defense is this? Or what? And then they're just randomly playing moves. Like, usually it doesn't end up working but sometimes it could but but in blackjack certainly where people have cards on like 
if you gave a hand to any of the top players in the world and they were at a point in the table, they would always have the same action of whether to fall. Like, yeah. But if you give it a beginner, they'd be like, ah, oh, like, fuck it, I'll go to the bathroom now. I'll just go all in. Like, they just yeah, would yeah. just be... They just don't care. Yeah. Because they don't realize the significance of, like, you know, holding or not. Yeah. It's the same with, like, chess positions, though. Because if you start a... So, like, some chess puzzles where it's an end game position. Mm. And, like, for someone like me or you, who aren't, like, grandmasters, we would probably just, like, say if there's a rook, we'd be like, oh, I'll move this over here. <laughs> Whereas, like, for the top, probably a couple of hundred chess players in the world would make maybe between one and two, three different moves. And it's obvious, position. almost. Yeah, it's yeah. like they would move there almost instantaneously. Like, yeah. Which is crazy. But the that idea that... that um that the best people in the world have this intuition about which moves like they, they they're not thinking through every possible move they no. just know intuitively yeah. but that intuition is basically just a high level calculation like somewhere yeah. they they remember they know yeah it's you kind know. of like a you've a load of input data from like previous games and it's kind of like a high level blurred out version of that mm. but that to save time it's almost like yeah. the pruning uh thing we're talking about where it's pruning yeah, like taking away all those different yeah, yeah the branches of your but the other place it's evident is when you see two pros play and there's half the pieces on the board and then one of them goes i forfeit and you're oh, like yeah. what <laughs> yeah, i thought yeah. this was ongoing yeah, yeah yeah there's still loads of yeah loads but play. both of them have seen through the end and, and well like in most uh high level chess games like if you make a mistake uh you will probably lose a piece and at the highest level like losing a pawn is a massive advantage to the other player so like a lot of people will just resign unless there's a clear way that they could get a draw mm. um but it's say like halfway through a game half the pieces are still on the board and you lose a major piece like a knight or a bishop that you may as well just resign because the other player is not going to make or it's very unlikely like extremely unlikely they would make a mistake yeah to for you to gain a piece back because you're a piece down so it makes you harder yeah it makes it harder for the, you to get yeah. another one back and yeah so you may as well just resign yeah. whereas at an amateur level people can easily make mistakes or just not see that they left pieces hanging like major pieces even if you're up you could just leave a queen hanging mm. you're like oh crap i've just lost the game yeah <laughs> or else you leave a queen hanging and then your opponent doesn't even see it and you're like oh phew i thought i well, yeah, you know. yeah that, that'll happen at like the most beginner levels of chess yeah. where there are pieces hanging and people don't pick them up it's yeah. just like an insane way to play chess but, but that's why very I, entertaining. if there's there's some commentary i watched of a chess uh, match a few uh, i watched it a few weeks ago but it's years old but the commentators are so passionate and like yeah. it's really cool and it's such a weird thing to commentate on though because like if you're looking at the so uh like recently carlson played uh caruana in the world like championship and the way they do it is that the top two players if they get close enough in their rating they'll like organize to play each other in a couple of games um to determine who's the best in the world um and at the start, they play classical games, so they're really long time controls. Uh, so it's not really pressured under time. And then if they're all drawn, they'll reduce the time controls until somebody comes out mm-hmm. as a victor. But like in the longest games, people will, like their moves could be 10 minutes between moves. Like how does somebody <laughs> commentate on that? Yeah. It's so difficult because they're just speculating what they're thinking. And like at the start of the game, it's so difficult. Towards the end, it might be like a little bit easier. It's kind of the middle mm-hmm. game is probably the easiest for to predict when like all the pieces are like interlocked and it becomes obvious where the best place to move is but usually they would make those moves faster so Mm. when it's in a really confusing position and they take like 10 minutes 30 minutes to make a move or something like that and you're commentating like oh maybe they'll move the rook here or maybe here or maybe they'll just push this pawn up one but they write about the game so they're like oh the great game of 96 when he like and the game was remembered for one particular move when like the knight to b4 move or or uh but, yeah, I mean, some people will, like, just memorize those games off, like, even mm. not top-level chess players. But if you go to, like, a, a chess, like, lessons and stuff, people mm. actually have chess lessons, like, mm. for kids and stuff. They'll be like, oh, this game between, like, so-and-so from, yeah, 1986 or something, is, yeah. you should learn this game. And they will. And to and to, to say that, you know, pros are sitting over a move for, like, maybe half an hour, like, that just reminds me of doing an exam in college in the RDS and you're sitting there and you're looking at the page you don't know anything and you're just like oh crap <laughs> but, but like I just like for them to be able to concentrate for that amount of time solid without needing to be like 
Ah, uh, like I would just get distracted so quickly. And, and yeah, like a lot of them would go outside. Like they'll leave the table mm. and they'll like go for a walk or something, you mm. know, to like clear their head. But they'll remember the position perfectly. Yeah, and they'll just like run through permutations in their head. It's crazy to like watch them talk about it after. Mm. I remember seeing like Fabiano Caruana after one of the games talking about a particular point in the game and saying like, "Oh yes, I remember that. I was thinking if I did like, you know, pawn f seven." Rook and he's like flying through moves at ninety miles an hour, and it's like, how are you doing this? This yeah. is insane. But he, but I think one of the uh, Carlson said something similar. Like he can play multiple games at a time yeah. because if he came back to a board and a person had moved one piece that wasn't there, he'd be like, that's wrong. Yeah, something is different. Yeah, because he just instinctively knows, like, no, that wasn't yeah. where, and it, like it's just the way it would the game would be. So maybe they're yeah, so smart. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know, like, what it is, if it's just some sort of, like, kind of an eidetic memory for just chess positions, because I don't think it's, like, a general thing. Like, they couldn't remember, they wouldn't have, like, perfect memory for a random picture or something. No, yeah. It's just that position they'll remember, and it's just from, like, playing chess, I think. I I think it's developed rather than... There's a big, like, there's a big correlation between, like, chess and, like paranoid schizophrenia as well like people who yeah. play it for years like that bobby fisher ended tragically as well like yeah. he kind of went mad but they yeah if you just get so into it and you're just playing like 20 hours a day of this like defensive attack and just learning like it's so intense it is very very intense i remember before that world championship there was like or before one of the games mm. there was a video uh like a kind of a promo video of uh caruana's team like they'll have a team of people because he has to play against other people to like train and like practice and stuff mm. not even like it's not practicing, but it's just like considering different uh, positions that your opponent might have in the you know world championship, or whatever. And um, so the promo video was put out, and then they realized that at the on the table, like there was positions that they were practicing and stuff. And then they were freaking out, being like, "Oh, like Carlson will see this and be like, oh, I can see what he's looking at, so now I know what to look at.'" And yeah. It was like, "Oh, there was a big hullabaloo about it," but I don't think anything ever came of it. It was interesting, though. Just There's, like, all that tactics behind it. That's... But that's what people thought before computers were developed to be good enough at it. They thought that's what it takes. Like, a mind that's as rich as, yeah. as like, Carlson. But it, people have found, actually, you can make something narrow, much narrower. Yeah. Like, that the algorithms will carry over, but, yeah, it, actually, it can't make a cup of coffee. Like Yeah, you just need a stockfish algorithm that will have an opening book and can brute force everything, and it'll beat you. Hmm. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's pretty good. I think we'll all go away from this and be much better. And I'll start playing chess. Yeah. <laughs> Any, What's uh, your chess rating? Do you have a chess rating? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, I just <laughs> so we played where in the po- in Stag's head. We played on your phone over Christmas. Oh, we did. I think yes. Uh, I think I won. Yeah, because I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, yeah, like I do play some online, like on Lee Chess. I stopped playing on Chess dot com, but on Lee Chess. I'll just be open. My rating is 1400, which is pretty goddamn average. I think it's like smack bang in the middle of average. But uh, yeah, it's fun. I mean, you can be worse than average. That is true. You're an average physicist. Yeah. It's got me this far. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right. great. You're a great scientist. Thank you. Thank you very much. Will we leave it there? I think we'll leave it there. Talk to these fine folks some other day. Let's go find out how to play Go. <laughs> yeah say something conclusive there <laughs> all right everyone thanks um talk to you later if you want to follow us oh yeah we'll be on the internet on twitter twitter instagram We're on instagram. instagram instagram's pretty slow at the minute but we'll pick it up yeah see you later give us a like